examination of preparation, so the first section of the book, and then the second on the attentive aspect of hearing the Word of God. And so he connects it with the, the catechumenate, those who prepare for baptism. Um, all right, so now we look at section three on page 16, or part three as he has it, part three. And this is Notice he labels it as being God's kingdom. The already, so it's already here, the kingdom of God. When you read in the scriptures and when you come across these terms and in the prayers about the kingdom, you have the impression that the kingdom, of course, is already here. Our Lord says the kingdom of God is present among you. You know, and he says that the kingdom has been since the preaching of John the Baptist. And at the same time, we ask that the kingdom be accomplished as something to be done. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Because the essential aspect of kingdom means that diminutive or that directive aspect of God's will. Right? And so that's accomplished in our lives individually, morally, by grace, transformation that takes place in the healing and the elevation by grace. And it's also a thing which is the reality in which we make part of which we also will be identified on the earth with that body of Christ, the church. And then, of course, its definitive realization is something which will only take place after the day of judgment, something which is definitive only in the presence of God. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. All right? So this section, the section three, this is... This is the aspect that becomes interpersonal. Remember, we talked about that the bima, the old synagogue services, that reading is then the procession that takes place with the prepared oblations from the bima into the Holy of Holies. Right? So it's a movement to what the pre, what they have, he listed here as a pre anaphora, but in fact, the pre anaphora is this whole section that takes place in one and two. You're initiating the anaphora. The anaphora means the offering up, the bearing up, anaphoros, anaphora. So the anaphora is the bearing up. And so it begins with this section three. Now we call the specific anaphoras, the ones that we have written in our books, as being the central Eucharistic prayer. But the whole thing is this movement now in section three. So what takes place here, as he gives it being God's kingdom, we enter with that second Aramaic entrance of the Itelvot. We enter into a much more connected aspect of kingdom, which
Malukuto in the Syriac. Maluko is king. Malukuto, or O U T H O. Malukuto is that kingliness or that directive aspect, the governor. We enter into that relation that we move into the Holy of Holies, that presence. Right? So that's what we're giving in English here as being the kingdom. Okay? So, this third section, notice then what he ranks here as being the transferring of the offerings. The transfer of the offerings, which again, historically in the Syriac rite, is moving from the throne, from the bima, where they've been prepared by the deacons during the readings, moving toward the Holy of Holies. Alright, so, if we put, we'll put the words next to these, I keep talking about them, we have a label of them. So, I mean, this is the bema. And bema in the Syriac means throne. Alright? <coughs> and this is the Kaddish Kaddishe, the Holy of Holies. So the beam is the entrance? The beam is the front. Oh, the front. Is the Golgotha just that little tiny square thing in the middle yeah. of Judah? Yeah. So this would be the Golgotha here. And this is, this would be the bench where the clergy sit, because everyone faces east. So you'd have the clergy sitting, the bima in front of them. And this is only drawn in, remember, as I mentioned, because in some of the Syriac churches, archaeologically, some of them have a raised platform that connects the bima to the, the Holy of Holies. It wasn't an essential part, but that would be your progression from the bima to the Holy of Holies. So upstairs we have it attached. <coughs> we have a lower level, and then we have an upper level that has now the, the turned around altar down in front, but it's elevated up. All right. So you're saying the beam is where you stand in front of? Yes. Okay. And I didn't, I didn't think it was right words to go again. Okay, so. So there's the movement, the physical movement, into the Holy of Holies. So the transfer of the offerings. As we mentioned, that the oldest records we have talk about the deacons going <coughs> towards the end of the liturgy of the Word, and preparing the altar, putting the linens on. The, the, when, the, when the Mass wasn't being offered, there was nothing on the altar, it was just naked. All right? And so placing the linens on the altar, of course, was, he said, done in silence. It was added to the solemnity. So the transfer of the offerings and then the commemorations that we have of the living and the dead. So again, in the Latin, in the Latin tradition, the commemorations of the living and the dead historically are divided. But the living before and the dead after the words of institution. It's the only liturgy like that. All the other liturgies, you do your commemorations in the beginning. You used to have them written, what we call diptychs. You had, you had a, a double-folded <coughs> list of the names that were being commemorated. The saints, the, as we mentioned later on in our intercessions, of also of the, the hierarchs, so the pope, patriarch, bishop. I don't know if you've heard that on Sunday, the previous patriarch died, Cardinal Spirit died on Sunday. Okay. So, um, so we have the commemorations of the living and the dead, and then we have that gesture as the commemoration of all those who have pleased you from Adam to this day. You have the imposition of hands on the signification upon the oblations which are there. And that's taken directly from the old Semitic practice of the scapegoat of the sins of the people being imposed upon the goat, which then was chased out, bringing the sins, taking the sins with him in the ceremony of the escape goat, or escape goat. It was the one who bore and then was chased out into the desert. Okay? So that imposition upon these oblations of the presence, our presence also placed here, while we commemorate all of the just and those who have served God from the day of Adam to this day. And you go through. 
And that's why if you have specificities in it now of certain names of saints which are given, the saint of the, the patron saint of the church is named, and the saint of the day. Now we don't just have, it's not for us just simply to come up with names of saints to throw into it. It's because this specific day is in their memory, or because this building is commemorating, named on their honor. Okay? So that's our commemorations of the living and the dead um, during that whole section. And we have to remember too is that the, the liturgy is offered both for the living and the dead. You know, we've had more masses offered for the intentions of the living, but the masses also commemorate both the living and the dead, not just dead people. Okay? That we also have liturgies offered for the intentions of these individuals. And so the commemorations take place at that moment. So the, or the oblations are brought to the altar. And that's why we have it so that the oblations where they're prepared on the side are then brought around. We don't just bring them straight down the steps to the altar. They go around to the front. Because normally they'd be coming from the center up. They'd be coming from the bima. But we don't have any, we don't prepare on the bima. <coughs> it's just part of the way the, the, the things are set up at present in the 20th century. All right. And then the commemoration of the living the dead. Now we come to the fourth section. Oh, excuse me. He's got the parallel at the bottom here. All right. So this movement is of the importance of the etel world that we enter into the Holy of Holies. And of course, everyone's not physically moving. Uh, it's one of the reasons why in some of the churches where they have the raised platform, because remember, the people are all around here. So if you have to push your way through a crowd of people to get to the Holy of Holies, uh, some of them have made the elevated walkway just to make sure that you have the open space to get in. Okay? If you've ever seen the Anglican churches, you have somebody always walking in front of the processions. And it reminded me of it because I saw you have the, uh, you have the, they had the graduations of the University of Maine and someone's carrying this mace in front of them. Well, in the Anglican church, these are called the verger. And the verger leads the processions with a big staff with a big head on it, basically to knock people, historically, to get people out of the way so the procession can make it to the sanctuary and the altar. Because right now we all sit in ranks because of, of the influence of Protestantism, which is primarily the word of God and then a lecture. That's the essence of it. And so we sat, and so now we have benches. But all the ancient churches, there's no benches in them. They're just open spaces. So when you have a crowd of people to go through, you have to ring bells, make announcements, push your way through the crowd, you know, whatever it may be. And it's not very dignified to have the acolytes carrying candles shoving through the crowd because you splash wax everywhere. So you'd have somebody in front of the verger who would go through. Now it's ceremonial because we're all stringed out in, in wooden benches and so we're behaved now. And so, but before we were just simply all over the place around the middle of the church. Yes? Um, what was the definition again of Makoto? Kingdom. All right, so number three then here in the third stage of the catechumen. So the one who has prepared by hearing, remember catechesis in number two, this is paralleling with the third one of the catechumen, the one who is receiving this catech catechesis. And so you'll notice in section C, or part three at the bottom of this page, or towards the bottom of the page, this is the question of engagement. All right, so this offertory aspect is meant to be shifting to not just simply my personal reflection, my attentive response to the vocal presence of the divine word, but now this becomes the interpersonal space. Right? Because we're moving from one that's more focused on me receiving, listening, attentive, examination of my conscience, my preparation, and now it's going to be the interaction between. And so therefore he gives a parallel on this third stage then of the exploration, the engagement, and he has here the connections between those that make up the saved, the elect, those already in the kingdom, the righteous and the just, and those who are on earth aspire to this kingdom, this inter-engagement. So what is taking place liturgically in a mini form on the altar is meant to represent what takes place in our daily lives in the reality of the church. There is an engagement between God and us and a collaboration. 
All right? And so that's why it's time to reflect on the deeper realities of our ultimate destiny. Okay? Why are we here? It's in the sermon from last week when I brought up when someone asked the question you know, uh, a few weeks ago, why do you have to go to church? Why do we go to church? You know? There can be all kinds of personal reasons, but there is an objective reason why we go to church. Okay? Most people go to church for whatever their personal reason is. They like muffins. Or, you know, <laughs> but there is an objective reason why we, why we go, right? So you're witnessing, you know, uh, they're witnessing in St. Jude's every day when the little, the little guys come. They're being trained that you get, you know, gummy bears and things during the Mass. And so you begin to like this place and the smell of the incense and the bells, right? <laughs> because you're being trained to this intercommunication. So different people have different reasons why they come. They come because so-and-so is there, and that's fine. And then so-and-so dies. And so that purpose of their coming is no longer there, so they drift away. And so that's why, in this whole catechesis in this book, it's important to understand what is the objective relationship between us and the divinity. All right? And so here in this whole transition to the Holy of Holies and to the anaphora prayer, the Eucharistic prayer, is this whole reflection upon the engagement and the discovery and the entrance, he says here, of the catechumen, right? To reflect upon the deeper realities of our ultimate destiny. Then lastly, we have the fourth section, right? Liturgically speaking. So this part three, as we mentioned, is this engagement. So it's very much connected with that engagement, that interpersonal relationship, which in our personal lives comes out through our prayers and our asceticism, our discipline, which after the, after the, the caffeine break, we're going to be looking at the Patriarch's letter again about the fasting, this, inter this response that we have to the presence of God within our lives by His grace. And so that's all about this section three. This is also why historically, especially in the West, we refer to the church as being church militant. It doesn't mean that it's, you know, uh, you know, that it's soldiering in the sense of that kind of militancy. But the church militant in the sense that we are engaged in the salvation of our souls, in this response to God's grace and His invitation, His calling us, right? The, the akleo the calling which makes the ecclesia, the church. All right? So that's really in the section number three. So it has references to the ascetic aspect, the entrepreneur personal relationship, and our church militant engagement, which is why it begins with the commemoration of the living and the dead, who are part of this reality. Those who have fallen asleep, those who have departed, those who are Geniza in Syria, who are no longer seen, aren't gone just because their bodies have died. Okay? And that's always been the vision of the church. Then we come to number four. Now number four becomes the presence of God himself. And that's ultimately the answer to why do we go to church. I gave you the parallel between looking at the, the Kennebec through the doors, which is fine. That's God revealing himself as creator. But that is not God in the Blessed Sacrament revealing himself personally. Right? So it reveals an aspect of the divinity. As we mentioned numerous times, why we get romantic about mountains and rivers and stuff is because of the British Protestants of the 19th century who had extra disposable income with nothing else to do. They're the ones who create tourism, and they're the ones who create the romanticism of all. And so you have the romantic poets, the romantic artists of the 1800s, and the whole quest for them is no longer God in their religion because they're losing their Christianity at that point in the 1800s. Now it becomes all. Make me feel overwhelmed. And so, of course, that's why all of these British aristocrats gravitated to the Alps. You know, and it's funny being in Switzerland because they talk about that. You know, this is, all, this is why Switzerland is the number one place to go. You want to work in hospitality? You go to the schools in Switzerland because they've been doing it for longer than anybody else. Because they always British show up in these peasant villages saying, um, where can I stay? It's like, ooh. 
And what's the name of that? It's like they're the Alps. They, you know, every mountain doesn't have a name, you know, but oh, it's got to have a name. It's awesome. And it, you know, for the average person there, it's, it's a barrier for me to get to the village on the other side. I mean, they appreciated the majesty of them, but they didn't romanticize them. Okay, so this is very much something, the spirit, which has been lost. We mentioned, I gave you talking on Sunday, you know, people would say, well, I go on a hike on Sunday morning. I don't need to have church. I find God in the trees. That God, that would be fine if God had never revealed himself personally in Jesus Christ. But since Jesus Christ has, is the revelation of God personally, it's because he desires a personal engagement with us and not just simply admire what I made. Okay? It would be the equivalent of you showing up at the carpenter's house and just going around the house admiring the furniture that he made, which is absolutely awesome. You know, or visiting the Shakers. This is beautiful design, but refusing to talk to the Shakers themselves. Let me just look at your boxes. <laughs> I think the box is so awesome. And that table over there? Oh, let me just... <sighs> While they're trying to visit... Shh! <laughs> Can you just go out of the room, please? I just want to look at this one. That's the equivalent. I want to go that's look a, at the big rock. That's a really good analogy. <laughs> but I don't want to hear what he has to personally say. And that's why I'm emphasizing here this, this transition part is the interpersonal. It's when we begin to engage with what's going to take place in the climax of the epiclesis. May the Spirit of God come down and transform this bread and wine and transform us as you transform the womb of Mary of Nazareth to bring forth the God-man. So we also ask for that transformation. Right. So that's, what, that's the section four, when we bring us into this real, the central aspect of the what he gives here as the sacramental and the moral life. This is the anaphoric aspect. This is the real offering. This is the corbono. Remember, corbono means offering. Anaphora means, in Greek, it's a Greek word. It means the offering. And so the offering, we come to the essence here. So we have three parts in this liturgical structure to prepare us for the moment that God appears to us in the mysteries of Mount Sinai, if you want. Right? Remember that Moses in the beginning <coughs> comes toward the bush that he sees burning <coughs> out of curiosity. He moves towards it because, first it's curiosity, it's not really burning, it's not falling into the fire. It just keeps burning, but it just stands there, it's not burning up. And so he goes out of curiosity, there's a personal provocation that brings him to a consideration, but it's here when he hears the voice of God, take off your sandals, remove from your feet, the ground you are on is holy. Then he's brought into this now in the communication with the voice of the watcher from the bush, which will bring him into that contact and the mission of what he is meant to do, which will be the communication that you will go and bring my people out. And so you see a parallel also with that whole aspect, which is brought then in the, in the personal expression of God in Jesus Christ in these divine mysteries. And that's why three, pre, three parts preparation to bring us to the fourth point which is now the divine presence. Not symbolically, but it is truly, really, substantially, body, blood, soul, divinity. This is my body. This is why our Lord leaves this to us on the Last Supper, to bring us to the possibility of engaging on that direct personal, not symbolic, not a historical reference to the past, but here, this day, Sunday the 12th, at 10 o'clock, we have the ability to be entering into what is hidden, the rozo, into what is the manifestation of the counsels of the King of Kings, the rozo, or the mystery of what is hidden to us, or the sacrament, what is the inviolable ceremony manifesting to us this reality of God's personal presence. And so we have those terminologies of sacrament and mystery and rozo. And that's what's bringing us into the fourth conclusion. So the sacramental and the moral life and the anaphora. So we have the giving of peace. The giving of peace is not 
a Fourth of July salutation. You know, you've already talked to Anne when you saw her when you first came into the church. This is directly connected with the, the parable that our Lord speaks on. If you bring an offering to the altar, and while you are before the altar, you realize and you consider and you know that one of your brothers has something against you. You need to fix something here. You are not properly disposed. You leave your offering at the altar, he says. You go and you be reconciled to your brother. Then you return and make your offering at the altar. That's the sign of peace. Yes? I don't know if I have this right or not. I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> I think what you're doing is you or Steve and the altar servers get the sign of peace from the altar. Yeah, come, yeah that's and, exactly, yes. That's and then what, come through and yes. give it to us. Uh, Are we the only ones that do this? Because no, the everyone, other churches... everyone is supposed to do it that way. Because the Roman churches just turn around and St. John's and Notre Dame. Right. There's nobody that leaves... That's what, so we're, it's a good point. That's what we're getting to right now. What the actual... What is this thing that we're doing? So the first of all is the teaching. You... The sign of peace is to say, I'm in good standing now. I don't have grudges. I'm not in antagonism and lifelong <coughs> ruptures with people around me. That's what the peace is supposed to mean, personally. That's why our Lord says in the Gospel, if you realize you have a brother who has something against you, something you need to fix here, you leave that offering now, and you go, and you be reconciled, then you come back and make your offering. One of the teachings in the gospel. So, hang on. so what our Lord does here is he's engaging the person on what has to be done for disposition before the altar. Everything in the gospel is about personal inner disposition, and this is one of them. So what all of the churches have done is made this be part of this anaphora, this offering. Now, it's not just simply to say, okay, everyone good here? Can we go on with the rest of the ceremony? Yeah, it's cool. My aunt, but I fixed it up last Tuesday, we're okay. Uh, that's, so what everyone has done is to ritualize it, and so what takes place? Peace be to the holy altar of God. The altar represents Jesus Christ. It is the presence of Christ among us. And therefore, we do a salutation of the altar by the principal celibate, by the priest. Peace. And remember, peace is not locking ourselves to a chain of a nuclear power plant. Peace is not dressing up in whatever kind of bizarre costumes they've been wearing down Alabama because Alabama's trying to stop murdering babies. What are the handmaids or whatever? So you see the picture of these women dressed in these. I mean, this is becoming absurd. we're becoming so ridiculously absurd. Anyway, but that's not peace, and that's important to understand in the in the anaphora of Saint John Chrysostom. When we ask that praise at the prayer, may we think the words of peace, act peace, right? To enliven peace. Peace is the translation in English of the word shlomo. We've talked about shlomo until the cows have come home. This no this this shalom. It's the well-being, wholeness, integrity, restoration. It is the idea of wholeness. Right? And so that's the peace. And so what is taking place at this moment, liturgically, it's been ceremonialized, is from this presence of Christ even now, even before the actual anaphora, this presence of Christ, which is the consecrated altar, we salute it. Right? Peace, shlom. Right? Shalom to this altar, the holy altar of God. Peace to the ministers, those who are immediately at this altar. Right? And you, know, you will note that the subdeacons, the deacons, they put their hand on the altar. It's what you used to see when your brothers and that were serving Mass, they would, because we were Latinized, they would kneel at the altar and put their hand on top. But the ceremony was, they are physically touching that Christ that consecrated altar, and the priest transmits this peace to the minister. And then to the servers, peace to you, so this peace to the server of God. And then you see them leave the altar because they're bringing something which is meant to be psychologically our position of, no, I am not in grudge. I am not in, not in a bad disposition. I am at peace as so far as I can be humanly. 
<coughs> Everyone has relationships in which you have some neurotic, psychotic individual who's just going to hate you for the rest of your days, and you can't fix that. You've done what you can. That's not a grudge. That's just this is a painful part of human existence. That's why our Lord says, you realize you, your brother has something against you, you leave that, you go, you be reconciled, then you return. And so in the ceremonialization of this whole thing, then, the peace, shalom, flows from Christ. It's the first thing he says on the morning of the resurrection to the apostles. Shalom kulchun, peace to you all. It's what comes up continually throughout the whole Mass, right? Peace be to you, peace be to you, peace be to you, and with your spirit. All right, this, 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 this Old Testament salutation. So, what the so other what's happening is it's flowing from the altar. The servers come down. They go, obviously, just down the center aisle. What is supposed to happen, and we'll explain all this next year when we keep going through all of our uh, liturgical and, and details of stuff. What the server is supposed to do is they come down and they pass that to the next person. And so what happens is, is when you come, the same way you watch the servers, peace be to you, O server of the Holy Spirit, right? They receive it. The, the hands of the person giving the peace are folded. The person bows to them, shlom loch, peace to you. If it's a woman, shlom lech, right? The person receiving doesn't say anything. They bow, they place the hands on the outside, and they pull back. They turn to the person next to them in the pew, and it's the same thing. Shlom lo. Now you have received the peace that is passed through the members of the body of Christ, passed one to another. It's actually a very restrained ceremony. It's not you, you know, or waving peace signs all around the church to everybody. All right. That is so 1970s and has nothing to do with our liturgical tradition. So what you have then is coming to the end of the pews, the servers or the ministers come to the alt, so the person who's on the outside of that pew would bow, receive the peace, and then turn to the next person in, in their pew, peace be to you. And you can say it also with you, and you pull back on the hands and you, and you turn to the next person. It has nothing to do with the people in front of you or behind you. I mean, it could be, because historically we weren't, you know, stratified in pews anyway. So, but that's how it passes. But is it just us that does this, or the other church? I mean, you no, were Latin for a long time. Used to, everyone, yeah. everyone does it. So for the Latins, all right, since you brought... So in the Latins, in the traditional, the way the Latin mass works, it dropped in the Middle Ages because whenever you try to do something with a crowd of people, it usually becomes chaos. And so eventually what happened in the Latin church, it became restrained only for the clergy around the altar. So what you would do then, the peace, you go through the same thing. There was a prayer before it, the priest would kiss the altar, he would turn to the deacon, the deacon would bow, Pax tecum, peace be with you, ecum spiritu tuo. The deacon would give it to the subdeacon, and the subdeacon would go out among the people. Now, that's what it was historically. But again, like I said, whenever you try to do something with a crowd of people, it's like herding cats. And so they tend to become kind of cat. So what happens is you stop doing it. Does, okay, let's just, so you give it to the monks or the clergy that were around the altar, signifying everybody else, but it's just for ceremony. They know what's happening, and not necessarily the peasant coming in off the street really knows what's going on. And so what happened is it became more and more restrained. But obviously at times you would have somebody in the congregation who would be, you know, noteworthy for us really to point out, you know, in a sense, at the peace. So you used to have what are called pox breeds. And they were these wooden sculpture of tablets with the Lamb of God on them. Because this is the other difference for the Latins. The Latins do the ceremony before communion. And they are the only ones of all of the liturgical traditions. Everyone else does them before the offertory, with reference to our Lord's scripture of your offering, your gift. And for some reason, we don't know why, the Latins moved it to just before communion. And so it's connected with the Agnus Dei. The Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, repeated. It used to be repeated over and over again because it was what you were doing was breaking up all of the consecrated altar bread to give distributing communion. 
And then once it became more stylized because the breads were prepared ahead of time, the Byzantines still cut up. They spent a lot of time up at the altar cutting up these loaves and the little pieces all over the place. And, but since we started making the small, you know, unleavened bread, you didn't have that. So Gregory, Gregory the Great Pope, you know, around the year 600, he said, three times is enough. You know, Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God, okay, fine. And so he just repeated it three times because three is good. He's also the one who made Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy, Kitty at least some kitty. He made it three, three, three. All right? And so, because if you've been to a Byzantine church, Ukrainians and that, you know, they'll just keep singing out, you know, you know, God have mercy on us, God have mercy on us, God have mercy on us, you know. And so the deacon goes, Whoop, okay, and he has a, a liturgical way of moving us to the next section. Okay? So the piece, so what would be the pox breed, would be this image of the Lamb of God. That's why I brought up the Lamb of God is associated with communion, because that's what the Latins are doing. So what they would do then is the priest, then in kissing the altar, would also then kiss the pox breed, and it would be taken to whoever, the mayor, whoever, the, like the noteworthy individual who might be here, and it was done. But that was also something that was only done regionally. But the peace again flows from the altar. It was never just a, a, a greeting. It always flowed for the Latins, for the East, everyone. It is a flowing from the altar. Yes? Um, so my question is, if you, there's someone that you can't be reconciled with, for example, because of this long-standing family feud and That's what I'm saying. toxic it's relationship. But let, me, let me finish. So what I'm wondering is, when we receive the peace, should we also perhaps focus upon wishing the peace upon them so that one day you might be. And I, and I do remember that, uh, they don't do it now anymore, but I remember that uh, back during the, the 80s, the priest would come down and shake hands with the first person in every Yeah, year. but it's not, the, it's not the priest never leaves the altar. He's in the Holy of Holies. He's okay. walking out into the congregation. Okay. That's why the priest doesn't, he's not supposed to be, but the rubrics are, the priest okay. doesn't leave the altar. But yeah, but those were the same years when they were yeah. playing banjos. You know, also. So you can't take anything that you saw from 1965 onward as a norm of the historical liturgical practices. So as a practical reality, how are we going to get from the way we're doing it, which is incorrect, to the way we're doing it? Just through catechesis. Because we're still, everybody still waves. No, but through catechesis. Through catechesis. And open, like I said, next year, starting in the fall, we're going to start doing how do you make the sign of the cross? What's the proper vow? Okay. So there are details, slowly, there are details okay. that incorporate what are meant to be expressions <coughs> of what we have interiors. And so, you know, eventually we will get to, probably two years from now, to the peace. If I may offer them, this separate from the peace signs, which I understand that, there's this incredible, beautiful, I don't even want to say energy, but there's this beautiful experience as you're sharing the peace with the people just beside you, around you, in front of you, that, that seems yeah. dynamic, yeah. that is beyond just receiving from yourself and just stand there if you happen to be yes. in your pew or something. But, it ha but that's that a psych it's true. It's absolutely true. And on an emotional, psychological level, that is wonderful. But it's the same kind of energy you feel when you go to a concert. No. No. Not at all. Absolutely so when it, not at all. Because if you just start turning around to say hello, it has no connection to the altar. No, no, this so what I'm saying is the ceremony that comes is because of what we're doing at this moment is that what we are greeting with each other with is not just simply a psychological or emotional public thing. Mm -hmm. It is the transference of the peace of Christ that we share in and participate. Yes, the ceremony is very moving. It has always been. And when you're sharing but it's not just Jesus. simply we erupt into saying hello to everyone. I agree. No, that's, that's what, what I'm, I'm saying. Is yeah. I, the ceremony is beautiful, but that's why it's even more beautiful. We understand what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You're saying, yes. Somewhere in our in the book, in the it says of the kiss of peace. Yeah. Um, you're saying you that's have? invalid. What? Basically, it, the kiss. Of, it should not be a kiss, or it should be the hand. You're in the Middle East, I can assure you, they're kissing you on the cheeks in Lebanon. <laughs> yeah. It's the reason why the men sat on the one side and women sat on the other side from the synagogue. It seemed totally inappropriate to kiss another man's wife, even on the cheek, during the sign of peace. And so men were on one side, women were on the other side. The Ethiopians to this day, like I told you, in Ireland, they did this up until the 60s. This is a very ancient practice that's always been around. 
Ayasa, you know, you, you wish peace to the other person. You know, in the Latin church, traditionally, you put your hands on the person's shoulders, and you put your cheek to cheek, and the other, the other, the other priest receiving puts it under the elbows. You know, and you say, Shlom Nov, peace be to you. I mean, now, a lot of times you see the Maronite priest, and they get big hugs up on the altar, and that's fine, too. But originally, it's meant to be, it's a bow, and it originally is a kiss. That's why all the prayers make reference to a kiss. Mm -hmm. It's very much the, it's Judas, that's why, if when you understand the salutation of the kiss, and again, for us, a kiss is always sexualized in the West. But the kiss was the greeting you gave to anyone who was intimate with you as a friendship, man, woman, or whatever. You know, even when I was in Switzerland, I'd watch the men, I, you know, I watched one of my priest colleagues when his brother came, another priest, you know, when he saw him, you know, you get three kisses, you know. One on each cheek, back and forth, make sure you don't slam heads, you have to get it right. You, you, you go, you go, that's why you have to, you always watch the, the, the Americans or somebody go, who are used to this, and they'll just kind of go forward to the wrong side, and then you get the head. You know, so you go to the left, because you're putting right cheek to right cheek. And so, yes, it, I mean, historically it was a kiss, but it's the reason why it, the sexes were, were divided. Yeah. And, and the, one of the original functions in the Latin church was the subdeacons kind of helped to make sure there's order on the, the women's side of the church. And one of the things the deacons did was monitor the side for the men. Because we had more than just one deacon in the church, you know. Or the exorcists were there to help crowds during the time of communion. Yes? And Does that go to the scripture where it says that you give your brother a holy kiss? Yes, that? absolutely. It's from the very beginning. So it's already it's already a Middle Eastern, if you want, or a Semitic greeting. But it's one you always see at the end. We just had it on Sunday, you know, the greetings. The greetings from the saints in Italy. So yes, you know, they greet you with a holy kiss. That's exactly what it is. Except for now in those letters, now it's going to remind you what you're doing at the Eucharist. And that the peace is not just simply a greeting of intimacy and friendship, it is now the peace that flows from Christ. Right? The shlom, shlom, the mishicho. And did you call that the first time you tried that? No, because I, I studied in Switzerland. I mean, okay. No. <laughs> I mean, you know, to give you an example, you know, when I was at the cathedral a few years back, it was Easter Sunday. You know, people at the cathedral didn't know who I was. We just finished the, we finished the mass on Easter Sunday morning. We've been shouting out our, you know, El Messia Coma, you know. And so everyone's very jubilant, and the ushers come in, you know. And, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of immigrants still in Brooklyn. They're on, they live on Staten Island, any of them. And they come in, and, and all of a sudden, one of the ushers who sees me, he says, Abuma, Adam Messiah come. And you answer, Hakim come. He was truly risen. And then, you know, he clearly just grabs me. So I give him a kiss on the cheek, gives me a kiss, and he says, No, two. And so he, <laughs> he says, No, two, Abuna. And so I say, Okay. <laughs> the friendship made it three. <laughs> okay. But yes, you, most of those prayers are the peace. So when you have that prayer in the beginning of the anaphora, they almost all make reference to a holy kiss. Right? But since we're not doing the kiss anymore, right, it becomes the, I mean, I suppose you can kiss the person if you want, and I'll make sure you know them first, because otherwise they're not used to it. Right? <laughs> so, and again, it's just a kiss on the cheek, or kiss on both cheeks, or whatever, you know. But it, it's, it's like the church does that. When you ritualize something, it becomes stylized, so everyone's doing the same thing. You know, spontaneity is not something good in public crowds. You know, it tends, tends to break out into mob, mob the emotion, all right? It just becomes a little too. So this, but that's the meaning of it. And so, yes, it flows from the altar. And then you have whatever hymn, right? We have that little, we have, it says it can, you can sing some hymn. And so, or you recite the little hymn that's in the book. And then you have the prayer of the piece that follows after. And then you have the prayer of the veil. That's the, the, it, it represents now the descent upon this piece in the spirit of God. And so the veil which is fluttered over. Now clearly, part of it was just practically, is because there used to be these enormous veils over all the oblations. And so pulling them up, to fold them, you just moved it into a stylized movement of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then you go into the blessing with that same veil, and then we enter into the anaphora itself. All right?
So that's it. We don't, we don't need to talk about the details of this fourth section. But just to note at the bottom of this page, and then we're done with this introduction, is this fourth stage that the catechumen sees the demands, the exigencies, the requirements of being Christian. I mean, even just the explanation of what the peace means and what we're actually indicating that as St. Paul says, be at peace with all men insofar as you are able. And there's just some things we can't fit. But we have to make sure that any animosity that exists in our lives is not from my fault. That's what we're obliged to do. Right? So misunderstanding or whatever. That's what all of this sign of peace is meant to be. So here, on this point four at the bottom, Father Salim is pointing out to us is that it is this question also of the demands, the exigencies of the Christian life of living the sacramental and moral life. This is the communi This is the level of this fourth level of communication and transmission. Remember, the faith is not the faith if it's not lived, and it's not alive if it's not transmitted. Right? It's something which is communicated. The making of one. And so this fourth part, the anaphora, beginning with the peace, is a question of communication and transmission. And see, the, the more that we understand these parts of the liturgy and what this means within our lives, we necessarily become apostolic. Because our desire is to communicate this great treasures to others. Not just because it's a Lebanese thing, but because it's the reality of the gospel of life that's communicated to those around us. All right? And so that's the fourth section. That's why he puts down the demands, the things that are required of us. But this whole section, it's why the fourth section within the Eucharist comes to its full apogee in receiving Holy Communion. That the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ are given to you for the forgiveness of your sins right, and for eternal life. And so that aspect of communication, what we receive at that moment, is being received not as a personal gift, but as a communication within a member of the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is meant to radiate outward. So it's not just communication that I have something and now I get to go to heaven. It's not the question of getting tickets about saving my personal soul, but it's a question of the communication of my life, which to the honor and glory of God, I, I transmit that reality of the gospel to others, and in doing so, I am guaranteed to be saved. All right? People obsess over this question of being saved. You will be saved if your life is oriented to the honor and glory of God. But the purpose of creation, the purpose of redemption, is the manifestation of the eternal goodness of God. And when we engage ourselves personally in that communication of divine goodness, we are guaranteed to be among the elect. We don't have to obsess over the numbers. But if we do not receive that communication, and worse, we do not transmit it, we are indicating that there is nothing within us. And that is when you become fearful that, in fact, you're not going to arrive in the fullness of the kingdom. Okay. And that just brings us back to the original question, why do we go to the place of the divine mysteries? I mean, now we have a beautiful church with windows. You know, but if things continue the way they are, I don't know if it's going to last to the end of the century, considering how the movements that go on among our people you know, in America are. And maybe you'll be back in someone's garage once again, or someone's back solarium, or around the pool. Who knows? And you won't have a building anymore. But the mysteries will be exactly the same reality. And those who see them will be there. And those who don't see them, those who don't see them even now, will obviously not be there. Because they don't even see it when you have the support and a visible encouragement to be part of those mysteries. All right? So that's the breakdown of the four sections. So take your caffeine break, and then we'll come back to the patriarchs. Yeah. And Put it up here. <laughs> Do you think that was ridiculous? We don't have a cross in a church wall, or is it just this? No, I mean, I just thought it was a very good thing. Yeah, no, no, we'll, we'll put it up. And then this will be the picture of the founders, and this will be the mass of 1947. Oh, wow. And it's because it was a Maronite thing. And this will be the center then of. 
<laughs> because that picture that Carol George gave us is just priceless. I'm very glad you're having it done over. Oh, they're, yeah, they've been framed for better than all that. So, all right. So let's finish up with the Patriarch's letter. We'll probably do part of it tonight and we'll finish it up next week. Because it's not just simply reading the letter. You can read that on your own. You know what's there. What I'm going to do is give you a commentary on this section. So, as we did the Patriarch's letter, and he be beautifully begins by the virtue of penance, talking about what is the reality that we're fostering by the ascetic life. Again, in this interpersonal communication, and then we talked about the sacrament of penance, the mystery of penance. And in the letter to the priest, remember this letter is actually last Lent. You know, this Lent hasn't been translated yet, so we'll be talking about this Lenten letter next year. Um, you know, if it's awesome like this one, super awesome. Not just simply always very good, which is the usual case. But this one is, and this is a good reminder, but in the letter that was written to the priest for Holy Thursday of the Mysteries, he also reminds the priests to make sure that you are in disposition to offer the sacrament of penance for the people and to encourage them to engage with it, which is also telling you that there's probably a lot of places where they're not doing that. And what he also then goes on to lament is he talks about in this letter the great ignorance among so many of our people who no longer frequent the churches and who do not know the faith. And he reminds us of the necessity to be teaching. Right? So it's quite interesting. So you know, remember, you know, Patriarch Bashara is a, he's a teacher. That's what he's been during his lifetime. He's a, he's a religious, he's a monastic, and he's, he's been a teacher. And so he's clearly also reminding us of these obligations. And so he breaks it down. The sacrament. So first the virtue of penance, then we saw the question of the mystery of penance, and now we come into the question of how then the habitual practices, after talking about prayers, fasting, so we have almsgiving on page 10 there that we left off with, before the resurrection. So now we come to the third one on the practical guidelines, the pastoral guidelines, the great fast, and then the other fast that we have throughout the year. The East has always been famous for its ascetic, not as a historical tradition, but because the Easterners have always engaged themselves at this level. That's why if you talk to FIFA, she'll remember all of the things that we have in this section of the encyclical to talk about. This is not the Middle Ages. <coughs> right? This is not ancient history. This is something that has really just simply collapsed as a practice from World War II onward. Because no one ever told you don't do it. It just became, we just don't do it. No one said don't do it, we just mm -hmm. don't do it. Okay? And I've mentioned to you before, one of the bizarre things that I find is that, you know, under the pontificate of St. Pius X at the beginning of the 20th century, and it's unusual, for some reason, the Pope for the Latin Church abolished the fast during Advent, which used to be every Wednesday and Friday. And clearly that was just left over from Wednesday and Friday was everyone's practice throughout the year. And the Latins only retained it for what were called the Ember Days at the Four Seasons. And then during Advent, Wednesdays and Fridays were fast the whole preparation up to the celebration of the Nativity. And I don't really even know why, but he simply abolished that fast in Advent. And it's been down for ever since for the Latins. You know, because there's just no memory left. And because we live in the Western world, though, mind you, we've talked about one of the ladies here who's an immigrant. She talks about this is everywhere now in Lebanon. You know, so this is this has kind of shaken everybody up as a reminder throughout the world. You know, because there are millions of Maronites scattered over the continents of the planet now. And so clearly this letter has given a good shake, which is great. So we mention here that the great Lent or the Great Fast, okay? So this period lasts for the seven weeks, paragraph 21, up to in the preparation of Easter, we all know this, and it begins on Ash Monday, but actually it begins on the evening of Cana Sunday. That's why you notice that in the books it says Cana Sunday, entrance into the Great Fast. That Sunday is already listed as entrance into the Great Fast. But you're not fasting during those daylight hours because it's the Sunday. So it's the resurrection. So 
So you're not fasting and you're initiating that fast with sundown. And then as I've explained to you then, we picked up from the Latin practice to do ashes. We're the only Easterners to do ashes because it's a Latin ceremony. And it's fine, it's a beautiful ceremony. But, you know, we make it a holy day of obligation. You know, but even for the Latins, it's not a holy day of obligation. All right, and so. So it's Ash Monday, it ends at noon on Holy Saturday. Okay, so at noon. At noon we have that ceremony of reconciliation, this rite of peace we call it, at noon on Saturday, the day before the resurrection. It's a very beautiful ceremony, it's very short, and almost no one seems to know what the heck it is. So that's one of the things we have to um, alleviate here. And it's not just here, it's everywhere, like I told you. And I was at Brooklyn at the cathedral that year, it's the day before my kisses in the sacristy, from the unshaven Arab, you know, unshaven Middle Eastern. You now he looks really sharp. You know, you dress up these guys from the Middle East, they actually look like the mafiosa from Sicily. You know, but they're, they're pretty, pretty sharp looking. I did a baptism um, when I was in Fall River. Mom was born here, but to immigrant parents. And Dad was actually from Lebanon. And so all of his buddies, so we have this big party, and of course it's all young people for the baptism, right? You know, the men and the women, you know, but the, they all look really sharp. You know, you, you scrub them up and you, they look good, you know. So anyways, the day before, no Abuna, three times or whatever it was, the day before we had the ceremony of reconciliation, you know, we dutifully sat in the confessionals and the ceremony went on and, and I think 17 people showed up at the cathedral. You know, so we actually almost do better here now already at this point. I think we had a dozen. How many do we have, Steve? Put that phone down right now. No, I was, I was entering in the past <laughs> times on my calendar. I really was. <laughs> How many people did we have at the right of peace? Did you have guess? About a dozen? 10? 10, 12, 13, 10, yeah. Are you talking about Saturday at noon? Saturday at noon. And then when you, you finish with Christ is risen, it begins penitentially, and the end of the ceremony lasts about an hour, it lasts about 45 minutes, and at the end you already have the acclamation. He is risen. Christ is risen. We don't do that kind of, you know, the reason why the midnight thing takes place is because the last of the ceremony is the lighting of the candle. We don't have Paschal candles. We don't do what's called the Lucinarium in Latin. Our ceremonies are different. Our Easter begins, our resurrection begins at noon on that Saturday. Oh. You know, did you go out for steak Saturday night? You were threatening it. Well, yes. But that's okay. But it was the same thing when I was at the cathedral. We did our ceremony of reconciliation, the rite of peace, at mid on midday on Saturday. And then the rector of the cathedral said, oh, we're going to go out for dinner. You know? So we just went to one of the cafes and we had a very nice festive dance. And that's when I, a festive meal. And it's when I realized this rector of the cathedral has been there for eight years or ten years or whatever. He knows everybody in Brooklyn, you know, because we can't walk down the street. <laughs> and I was saying hello to everybody. Not that there, Father James Root. Yeah. yeah. And it was a big celebration and that evening. The church doesn't bring in the new light, like, at least in the oh, church in Savannah, we didn't brought in like, the new light of the church for the year. Everybody. It's a lighting of a lamp. It's a lucinarium. The ceremony of the lamp. And then right. the Mass is on Saturday evening. It starts at 6 o'clock at night. It has to be after dark. Yeah, it starts there at dusk and then it goes <coughs> to so we were talking to Bishop Dealey here, because in the, in the Diocese of Maine, they keep trying to give you the time. You must not have the liturgy of the resurrection before dark. And so 8 p.m. is the minimum time. When I was in the Latin church, I used to do them at 10.30 at night. We'd start at 10.30, finish about midnight or something. It's funny if we had baptisms. We had baptisms of adults, which we usually did, then it was guaranteed to go on for yeah, yeah, you'd be there for two and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah, so. a beautiful but we ceremony. begin at 10.30 and finish about 12.30 or something. Mm -hmm. But they don't have the marinade stuff. No, no, it's a totally different ceremony. I mean, it's just for us, it's just simply the, the liturgy of the Mass. But that's why, when you understand, I didn't change the time from four because it's just our normal juridical fiction of sundown being 4 p.m. on Sunday. You go, this, it's not, I mean, it's not, what we just do, there's no reason to change it later, because we don't do that ceremony. And since we've already introduced the acclamation of Christ is risen at noon, we're already in Easter as Maronites. Well, that's okay? Larry. Yeah. What makes us right? 
Huh? What makes us right about that? It's not a question of right or wrong, it's just a question of different observances. Oh. The Latins, until 1951, that vigil that now they're insisting has to be after 8 p.m. at the earliest, used to be at 4 a.m. on Saturday morning, because everything got pushed back throughout the centuries. Bishop Delian, when we were having our luncheon with the sisters, he was talking about when he used to serve as a boy. You know, he was saying, yeah, you know, before dawn on Saturday mornings. You know, so they would have beat us, in those years, they would have beat us up. Because we wouldn't have done it until noon. But their fast, then, the Latin fast, used to go to noon also on that Saturday. But in 1951, they took it out of the pre-dawn hours, and they did an experiment to do it in the middle of the night on Saturday. Father, would you, where it was historically. Would you expand upon what you just said, it's observance versus a right or wrong thing? Because I think the way we observe the rituals is the way the Maronite church does it. Yeah. And, and that's not necessarily a right or wrong. I mean, there are certain... There are right there ways are. to do it as Maronites. Right, exactly. But there's not a right or wrong between the different churches. Exactly, and I, I, I think people need to understand that. We're not saying we're the only way. We're saying, if you want to be a Maronite, do it this way. No. But see, what happens is with the Latin church, the Latin, the Roman church is Rome. And right. Rome is known for its administration, its efficacy, its efficiency. It's, it's not known for its art. All of its art is copying the Greeks. But it's known for its aqueducts, its roads, its buildings, its architecture. It is an organizing empire. That's why the Latin liturgy in itself is so simple compared to the Eastern Rites. It's nothing wrong with it. And in the traditional Latin Rites, they are profoundly beautiful. The orations in Latin are poetic. When you translate them into English, they kind of become, oh God, we love you so much, please make God love you more, to Christ our Lord, amen. You read that and you go, where is the poetry? Where? But when you read, and the orations of Sundays were the most ancient of these Latin forms, and some of them are just absolutely exquisite, in Latin, when you hear them, they are written for the point of the poetry and the beauty. Or someday, go to the Basilica and go see, even if it's not with all the bells and whistles, and see what it used to be. It was very lovely. But the problem is, is that when we did, like I just explained to you, the sign of peace at communion time, what, what used to be in the Latins, and now it's just, you know, the picnic. Um, it's because you've taken what are in themselves simple ceremonies, but that's very Roman. But the Romans have had this kind of, because they didn't seem to really appreciate the beauty that they had. I mean, I absolutely love the classic patrimony of the Latin church, mm -hmm. which is little resemblance to what we do these days. But when you translate that all into the vernacular, it looks all very pedestrian. You know, get us in, get us out, get this thing done in 35 minutes, and let's get out of here. The Easterners are in there for an hour and a half. Let's move it. You know, and it became, but that's not the reason why the Romans were not in that form because they wanted to get you. It's not a drive-through religion to get you in and get you out. It's because it was the expression of Romanitas, the quality of being Roman, which was efficient, direct, but it also had, like the shaker box, a beauty in its simplicity because it was an intelligent simplicity. It was not just for get you in and get you out, okay? You know, because, you know, some of the poor Latins, they come here on occasion, and it's like, man, you people are here for an hour and 20 minutes. This is ridiculous. And I, see, and I think you talk too fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you'd slow down. <laughs> I, yeah, because it actually goes, people are like, why do you sing everything? It's actually faster when I sing it. Yeah. <laughs> when I read it, you know, I'm going to read the whole thing, I'm going to be there longer. Well, you know, because plus, plus, we don't have that right, distinction. Really the In the yeah. Eastern Rites, everything is sung. You know, we don't have a distinction between a high mass and a low mass. We just have the mass. And the low mass developed in the Latin Church you know, because of the monasticism. And so the monks all started saying masses individually while the monastic mass was going on for the community. And they all radiated out the side altars. And so you obviously don't have a full team to do the full ceremony, so you just read it. So the proper term is not a low mass. Low mass means well, it doesn't have bells and whistles. Which then people got the idea was that the normal mass was the mass that was being read. And then if you're really into it, you throw in some incense and some extra bells and some extra people. 
to make it a little more foo-foo. And it's like, no, 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 no. The foo-foo is the mass. The red mass, the reading of just simply the text, was a development from that. Most people don't understand that. And see, in the East, we never did that. But because we are such a pull of the Latin church on us, you know, so many of our priests, and a lot of them study in France, you know, so they just pick up all of that kind of modern Latin, get us in, get us out, make it fast, expedite it. And so, but that's not our liturgy. You know, it's not our liturgy. So anyway, so here we are. So this whole idea, when we move into it. Now, number two, the breaking of the fast. Oh, I'm sorry. So we've got three points in this paragraph 21, you know. First of all, it goes from the Lenten fast goes from Ash Monday to Holy Saturday. The second thing is that the abstinence of eating from midnight until the noon. Now, clearly, historically, you didn't eat from midnight until sundown the next day. That's the historical situation, which is why when you know Muslims on Ramadan, they don't eat until dusk. That's the old fast. You ate at the end of the day. The end of the day was dusk, and dusk initiated the beginning of the next day, so you could break your fast at sundown. Now, because of these observances, which easily become legalistic, then they do their little broth and their bread, which is what's prescribed for the fast, and then after you do that, you push it aside, then you eat like all night long. You know, so you have the Ministry of Health in Egypt that will warn everybody every year, remember that you know, obesity and overeating is bad for your health, even though it's the month of fasting. Because it, you fast only from dawn to dusk. So for us, it's midnight until noon now, because certainly what happened over the centuries, it went from the evening, dawn, dusk, to 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and then eventually down to midday. And we said, okay, midday is cool. I can do that. I can do five hours of not eating after I've woken up, or six hours, but please don't make me go until sun goes down. Which is why to this day, so the 3 p.m. in the middle of the afternoon, in Latin that's Hora Nona, the ninth hour, right? Ninth hour, Hora Nona. But you can see the historical fasting aspect of it because Hora Nona was pushed down to midday, which is why our other name for midday is noon. noon. It's the pushing it back. So we'll call midday noon from the old Horda Nona, ninth hour of the fast. Yes. Do you know the age of Ramadan fasting? Because we have a niece and nephew. Their mother's Muslim. And I think they started as soon as the age of reason. <coughs> I think. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's number two. So for us, when we fast, we eat nothing between midnight and noon. Of course, what they're doing in Ramadan is they eat nothing or drink nothing, including water, until sundown. They will tell you about it before <coughs> stop also. But they all tell you, oh, it's Ramadan, we're fasting, it's a holy season. It's like, well, you just shut up. I don't want to hear about it. And that's when you hear the brilliance of our Lord Gospel. When you fast, don't let anyone down. Anoint your heads, wash your face, so that no one knows except your Father. It's completely opposite of the way the Muslims do Ramadan. All right? So I can see that Judith has known Muslims. Yes. <laughs> and they just talk about this all day. Let us take you, they make sure you know. I'm not, no, oh, you're, you're having lunch? Oh, that's, I'm Muslim. It's Ramadan. Why are you not eating? I mean, good. You know? I'm sorry for you. If you're a Christian, you could be eating now. Right? So. All right. So, but that's why it's come to noon now, at least since the 1700s. All right? Since the 18th century. Number three. It's refraining from eating meat and dairy products and eggs. So in other words, what the, abs what the fast is, is a fasting, it's an abstinence from all animals as animal products. You become vegan. That is the classic fast. All right? Not pescatarian, you know, where we're eating fish and stuff, but and so this... 
this is the standard to understand that even when we fast on Wednesdays and Fridays throughout the year, this is still the quality of the food. Hummus, so this is, <coughs> hummus is vegan. Yes. I love fish hummus. is good then. All right. Right? Fish is not considered meat. Fish is meat. meat. They're floating vegetables. Fish is considered meat. meat. Yeah. No animal products. So, so where's your protein coming so, from? Peanut butter. Peanut butter. Soybeans. 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 Soybeans.
You know, so the idea is we came to the point where if you never ever practice, if you never make an effort, remember escasis just means effort. If you never make an effort 12 months out of the year, what are you possibly going to do on Good Friday when it's meant to be mortally sinful if you do not fast on Good Friday? You know, you're just going to be in agony because you have no discipline over your appetite for the other 363 days out of the year. But now you have Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. So when the other giving up for the, because the rest of the people just do some kind of penance, do acts of charity. Well, acts of charity are part of the alms. Alms, fasting, and, and, and prayer are the three Christian expressions of the divine life within us. You know, so doing works of compassion are wonderful, but that's not fasting. You see, so the idea was, in theory, well, we're not going to give you all these laws and rules. Just do charity. Well, that's so vague, it gives you no indication of what to do at all. So it becomes, I just want to eat sweets. But nothing wrong, you know. But, but not, about sweets, but not so what I'm doing here is, is that, look, as Maronites, these are our traditions. These are, this is what we have done for centuries. All right, so. That's why we talk about the question of quantity and quality, red meats, white meats. All right, now, the next paragraph. And we'll finish up with just this. So, breaking the fast. Now, again, fast meaning the quantity and when we eat. Okay? So, breaking the fast is permitted on Saturdays and Sundays. Okay? So during Lenten season, contrary to the Latins who fast on Saturdays, the Eastern churches don't fast on Saturdays or Sundays, which is why there's a different calculation of 40 days for the fast. Okay? So, but it doesn't mean that you eat whatever you feel like. It just means you can eat when you want, and as much as you want, really. But it's still vegan on Saturday and Sunday. All right, so... The breaking of the fast is permitted on Saturdays and Sundays and on the following feast days. So notice there are five listed here. There are five. They're missing one. I, I, put, I put number four in. So number one is the Feast of St. John Mary, right? our first patriarch in the 7th century on March 2nd. So that would be a day, you can eat during the day, you can eat as much as you want, but it's still going to be within the Lenten season, so you're still going to follow the, the vegan qualifications. The second is the 40 holy martyrs of Sebaste on March 9th. So see, there you only had to make it seven days. Okay? Then, of course, you only have to make it another ten days, because we have St. Joseph which of course for us should be even a bigger feast because it's our patron saint on March 19th. Then you have also the Feast of the Annunciation. That's not listed, I don't know why it's not there. But you have the Feast of the Annunciation on March 25th. Okay? And then the last one is whatever the Feast of the Patron Saint if it falls in, which doesn't really count for us because our patron saint is St. Joseph. So what you'll notice here is that the fasting and the abstinence remain obligatory at the beginning, at the start of Passion Week. So that's all of Holy Week leading up, that week leading up to the Resurrection, from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. That whole week is obligatory. In other words, you may screw up the other days of the, of the, the fast, but that week is supposed to be, you know, if you're not fasting at all during Lent, you're fasting at least that Monday, through noon on Saturday uh, on that time, plus, of course, Ash Monday. Okay, so from Monday to Holy Saturday at noon. And, of course, the next principle they give you is, of course, in general, the sick, the elderly, if your health's not good, you eat what you need to eat. You know, common sense here, okay? So they're exempted from the fasting and the abstinence, especially when we're taking medications, okay? But again, you have a medication you have to take that goes with food. It's one thing to have a handful of nuts to take the pills. It's another thing to sit down with a burger. You know, what do you actually, you have to have something in your stomach, okay? So, with the medication. So again, with the framework of what we're doing in the asceticism, you act accordingly, okay? And then, of course, they mention here at the end of this paragraph that children start fasting in the year following their first communion. In other words, the age of reason. So when should you be initiating your children into this fast? 
this ancient observance, you know, age of reason, following after that, eight, nine, so when you ask about the Muslims, I think probably nine, ten, they start initiating the little kids into it. Because if you don't learn it at some point, you're never going to learn it. And so, it's going to be, so, the obligations are from, from 18 and up, you know, for the Latin, you know, canonically. But for us, it's from the point of the age of reason. You're initiated in the practices that the big people are doing. Okay? Any questions? All right. Very good. Well, we'll finish this up next week now. Can I answer that prayer? Yes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. O God, who are before all ages, and exist from age to age, you are resplendent for our eyes.